Hello and welcome. So we're talking about search engine optimization today. Thanks for being here. Hope you're okay. Um, it would be quite good to get a feel for who's here. So just in the chat, first of all, can you hear me? Why don't you put a little yes in the chat if you can hear me? That would be quite good. Uh, let's just see if we can get some comments in the chat just so you can so I can check you can hear me. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Uh, and uh, we're going to be talking about search engine optimization. It would be quite nice to get to a feeling for knowing who's in the room. So if you're a beginner, then put B in the chat. If you are an expert, put E. And if you're somewhere in between an intermediate, put I. So obviously you can hear me, which is great. Uh, that's really good. Uh, I am absolutely looking for questions uh, throughout this. So if you've got questions, please do ask them uh, and uh, use the Q&A box if you can. Uh, but there's a moderator that will check the chat to see if the, if you do have questions. I'm uh, just going to bring up my slides for you. So we're talking about, oh, okay, so we've got some intermediates, beginners. I think there's a there's a, a bit of a delay whilst I'm talking in the chat, so that's fine. Uh, we've got lots of intermediates, uh, lots of beginners. Okay, I've I've aimed this at intermediates and beginners, so that's a good start. Um, and if you feel like you're an expert and you want to challenge me, then please do. Um, if you uh, want to add some value to this, then also please do. But it's, of course, it's such a wide subject. I've tried to cover the basics and give an overview, an overround picture of all the different aspects of search engine optimization. So I'm Johnny Ross. Let me just tell you, because it's a really um, important story as, as to how I got into this. So I set up an e-commerce store back in 1999 during the dot-com boom. We sold sunglasses. We were the biggest sunglass e-tailer in the UK uh, selling designer sunglasses. And we were bigger than all the, the, the bricks and mortar shops. We were, we were at the top of Google for everything to do with sunglasses, designer sunglasses, Armani sunglasses, Oakley sunglasses, Bollet sunglasses, Chanel sunglasses, Prada sunglasses, red sunglasses, green sunglasses. We were at the top for five years. In 2004, sales dropped, didn't really know why. Took us a month to realize that we were no longer on page one and we'd been pushed to page seven of Google. No one ever goes to page seven of Google. We got a Google penalty. We went through two SEO agencies over an 18 month period. Neither of them could solve the problem. We lost 40% of our turnover. In the end, I found a guy in New York who was on $250 an hour, but within two weeks, he got us back to page one, position two and three. Competitors had taken over, and it was really tough time. So I, I, I became really frustrated with the SEO industry. Uh, we were being told to do techniques that clearly Google wasn't wanting us to do. Uh, and it took, as I said, 18 months and a, and a real expert to come on board and help us understand. So I've been there, and what I do now is I try and play with Google and test and try and trigger penalties to understand how far you can push things and what you can do and what you can't do. So that's a bit about me. Um, I let me, What I need to do is sort of go back to the real basics of search engine optimization. So, you know, what is search engine optimization all about? And if we have a quick look at an overview of web traffic, just so we're all on the same page. So we've got organic traffic, Natural traffic, where someone Googles you, bings you, yahoos you, they find you, they come to you, it's classed as, as organic traffic. Pay traffic is those Google ads at the top. Display traffic is where there's an advert, a visual advert, someone clicks it, they get to your website. Social traffic from social media, from Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, etc. Email traffic from email marketing, referral traffic from other websites, from links. We're going to be talking about links today. Links from, you know, some, the, if we can get a link from Forbes, if we can get a link from the BBC, then those are trusted links and they can really help our website. And I might hear some of you saying, is it still about links? It is still about links as, me, as well as many other things. And direct traffic is where they come directly to your site. So just so we're all on the same page, those are all the different uh, types of traffic there are on the web. Now, if we look at the basics of what search engine optimization is about, we have to use some common sense. So it's about having great content. It's about ensuring that the uh, search engines can access the content because you could have the most amazing content, the most, let's think of it as a shop. 
you've got the most amazing shop, but if it's not on the high street and it's on a, a, a far back corner street, then if no one knows it's there, no one's going to come. So we've got to have great content, but we've also got to have it very accessible. We've got to make lots of unique and relevant content, really important, those two words. We've got to make content popular, and we've got to do some good old-fashioned PR, public relations. It's traditional PR, but online. So for me, those are the key elements to search engine optimization. And there's two sides to search engine optimization. There's the website itself, and then there's everything around the World Wide Web. As I said, I genuinely do want questions. It's brilliant that I've been invited to talk here today. I can't believe the amount of speakers and the amount of attendees. And I'm so pleased that you've taken time out to be here right now. I happily will uh, answer questions afterwards as well. And you can have a copy of these slides. If you simply uh, send me an email, I'll put my email address in the chat. Uh, and if you just simply say uh, slides in the subject line, uh, then I will happily send the uh, the slides over to you. So there's two sides to search engine optimization. You've got the website itself, and that's about the keywords, the content, the technical aspect, and the usability. So it's about if so if you want to be found for something, you've got to be relevant. So you've got to think about what people are searching for, and you've got to uh, really think about um, what would they type into Google, what would they type into Bing, Yahoo. And are you relevant for that? Are you going to be found for that? Have you got good content? And the technical aspect, the usability, can it be used on mobile? It's it, it's an old thing to say, but so important. And so many people are still producing websites that aren't mobile first. Technical aspect, are we using things like schema? Are we marking content up? Are we uh, making sure that it works across browsers? Have we got our OG tags sorted out? Have we thought about our IP address and checked it's not blacklisted? Have we got a good server that's providing the website? So those are the some of the key things that we'll discuss. And then on the second side of search engine optimization, it's all about the offsite. It's about the relevancy. It's about the reviews. It's about the links. It's about the reputation. What are people saying about us? Who's linking to us? What are they saying? Are they trustworthy? What are our reviews? What's our reputation? And those are the key differences. So we've got on-site and off-site. So we're going to focus on-site first. And I'm going to, I do hundreds and hundreds of, of uh, audits on a, a daily basis, uh, not on a daily basis, sorry. <laughs> I probably do um, maybe one to two audits a day. And uh, to give you some idea, what I've decided to do in these slides is to bring all the key elements of an audit in to helping you think about some of the things that you need to consider when you're uh, trying to get higher in Google and climb that Google ladder. So first thing to do is think keywords. Now, for the beginners, hopefully this is helpful. For the intermediates, I apologize in advance. I've, I had a client very early on who wanted to be at the top of Google for gift ideas. And I said, brilliant idea, but it's going to cost you a lot of money. It's a very high volume search. It's very competitive. And it's going to take a, a, a serious amount of money to achieve that. But I suggested to them that if someone's searching gift ideas, they're probably not ready to buy. So we need to think of some longer tail keywords. And yes, you might think this is old fashioned, but it still works and it's still good. So it's to think about what are the longer tail, the phrases. So we need to look at sort of sort of the, the lower, uh, lower search volumes, but more relevant search. So for example, a retirement gift eyes for a retirement gifts for women search. If we could provide a very relevant page, and if you have a look at competitors and they're not producing something as relevant, then we can really increase the conversion rate. So, and it won't take a great deal to be hiring Google for a longer tail keyword. So, one of the first places to really start is to go to Google, type in instinctively what you think you'd like to be found for. And Google will start suggesting keywords that based on what other people have typed. And my advice is to come up with a list of a thousand, if not more keywords. The more keywords, the better. And you use that to understand where you are in Google, but also 
to use that those keywords in content across your site over, let's say, a 12-month period to produce content that's going to be relevant. If you want to be at the top of Google for cars, then you're going to have to be at the top of Google for red cars, green cars, per, uh, electric cars, diesel cars, petrol cars, Nissan, Audi, Porsche, fixing cars, how to drive a car, car insurance. If you weren't at the top of Google for all of those things, then if you were Google, why should you put me at the top of Google for cars if I'm not at the top of Google for all of those other things? I think that's the case. I think that if you want to appear at the top of Google for such a generic word, then you're going to have to appear at the top of Google for many other things. So we need to consider those other keywords and we need to consider how we can really uh, uh, work on them. Here's some great tools if you're looking for what people ask and longer tail keywords. So we've got answer the public, story based, question samurai, keyword.io, buzz sumo question analyzer, semrush, KW finder, curo. Uh, Google Autocomplete, and People Also Ask Box, which is the Google Box. So those are just some of the tools to help you find uh, keywords to uh, and phrases and questions. So now we need to think about the content. We've got the keywords. We now need to think about the content. Well, there's so many types of content. And as I said, if you want a copy of these slides, just send me an email. Uh, there's a couple of these slides that are quite jam-packed. I expect you won't have time to write everything down, um, but uh, let's just go through a few of these. So content, well, it could be anything from blogs, thought leadership style, opinion pieces. This is what I think. It could be interviews. It could be case studies. Case studies build trust, but also they're great for search engine optimization because you end up talking about your products and services. Maybe you could gather reviews and put them on your website. And of course, mark them up using schema. We're gonna be talking a lot about the technical detail. Uh, experiences, you could go to Google Trends to come up with content ideas. You could be doing vlogs, video content, infographics. Lists are a great thing. If you're struggling to come up with a blog, think of a list, top 10 ways, seven ways to do this, eight ways to do that, et cetera, et cetera. Content series. Think of a, a really deep topic and think how you could spread it over five, six, seven pieces of content. Number one, number two, number three, number four. And this week, we're going to do number one. Next week, number two. Next week, and the week after, number three, et cetera. White papers. Go into real depth. I've seen some amazing wins on white papers. A great way to uh, get data as well, to maybe ask someone to leave their email address before they can have the white paper, but a, a white paper full of rich content, which then can be turned into blogs, it can be turned into vlogs, it can be turned into infographics. How-to guides, surveys, polls, podcasts, top comments, quizzes, checklists, history timelines, industry event roundups, competitions, FAQs. I want to focus on FAQs. Google has categorically come out and talked about FAQs recently. What Google wants to see is FAQs across your entire site. But specifically, what we're looking for is unique FAQs on each page. So if you have an FAQs page that's maybe to do with customer service or delivery or refunds or, or how it works, or, or that's fine. But what I'm talking about is specific product or service FAQs. So let's say, for example, you have five services or 50 products. On each of those pages, Google, I would suggest that you have a unique FAQ, maybe three or four on each page that are totally unique to that service or that product. So on service one, three or four FAQs. On service two, three or four different FAQs. On service three, three or four different FAQs. On product one, the same, et cetera, et cetera. And what you'd do is you'd mark them up using FAQ schema which then tells Google that you've got some very relevant FAQs and the people also ask box starts getting your content. We're going to go into that a bit later. But FAQs are a great way to get keywords and questions and phrases across your website. Ebooks, day in the life and seasonal advice. There's tons of ideas there. You might be thinking, well, okay, I've written all this content. How do I get people to see it? Well, this is the slide for you. These are the ways to share content. So lots of different ways. Google My Business, Google's own listing, 
allows you to post content. Well, if you were going to tell anyone about your content, who would be the best person to tell? Google. Because Google is going to tell other people and put it higher in its search engine. So Google My Business is the first place to think about sharing content. Facebook groups. Facebook personal business and and, and groups. Your Twitter personal and work. Uh, LinkedIn. Email campaigns. YouTube. Share buttons. Guest blogs. A great way to get to get uh, trust, a great way to get, um, uh, the word has completely gone from my mind, referrals. The great A great way to get links is by guest blogging for other websites. I guest blog for a number of global SEO companies. I write a blog, and whilst writing that blog, I refer to something that I've written or created on my own website. So I talk about it, and I say, if you're looking for something a bit more in-depth, click here, you'll get to my white paper. Or click here, you'll get to a blog series that I talked about this. And that is a great way to build relevant links to your relevant content. Related blogs or popular posts. So when you are blog, when every time you add content, you need to be thinking about linking out to other related content that you've previously written. You could include content in annual reports. You could do uh, mentions and brands. You could do internal comms and staff emails. You could put it on service and product pages. Why wouldn't you? If you've got some great content, let's make sure it's across the entire site. Have a look at the service page, have a look at the product page, and consider, could I add links to that content there? At speaking gigs, right now, I could be sharing a white paper. I'm not going to do that today, but I could be, and I do it very often. Paid content distribution, so you could consider Outbrain or OneSpot, uh, nurture relationships with influencers, and of course, email signatures. Don't forget that we're all emailing all day, every day. We've got a signature. Why don't you drop some content links into that signature? We next need to think about the accessibility. We need to ensure that Google, more importantly, can access our content and understand it. And we need to make sure that users can use our website well and Google can see their experience is high. We need to make sure that uh, people aren't clicking the back button. We need, to, we need to reduce that bounce rate. We need to make sure that people are having a good experience on our website. And as I say, if you do have questions, please do ask. Uh, I'm just going to double check that we've not got any right now. I don't think we have. Uh, but as I said, please do ask them if you do have any. So we're going to focus on the technical aspect and the usability and the uh, making sure that Google can access the website. So here are just a few of the things that I would look at if I was doing an audit and some of the tools that would go with that as well. So one of the first things that I consider when I'm looking at a website is the speed. Google is very clear that it wants a fast website. It wants quick speed. And the reason for that is that we as users expect that. Google Page Speed Insights. It is a great tool, but it is also very difficult to win and to do well on that tool. But it's certainly a good guide. So if you were to Google Google, Google Page Insights, pop your website in there, it will give you uh, an insight on and a score out of 100 for mobile and a score out of 100 for desktop. It's mobile first. You need to look at mobile. Google has categorically said it's about mobile. So you need to look at the, getting that score at least into the orange and if not into the green. And there's a whole raft of uh, tips below when you put your website in there that you can share with your developer and say, look, we're trying to increase the speed of our website. This is what Google's saying. What could we do about it? And don't forget, it could be something as simple as what server is the website on? Or it could be something as simple as having an image on a homepage that's just way too big. and But there could be also lots of other things in between. Now, whenever I do anything, I always triangulate things. I always check with at least one other provider to see what else they're saying. I highly recommend GT Metrics. In most of the tools that I mentioned, you don't need the paid versions. On the free versions, there's a lot you can do. So on GT Metrics, you can input your website and it gives you a score. It gives you percentages and it gives you a whole summary of things that you need to do on your website to speed it up. So that would be the second place that I would look. I would take the website, put it into GT Metrics, and I would look to be getting at least a C 
if not a B, if you can get an A, even better. But most websites I look at will be uh, lower than that. Google's looking for uh, a page speed uh, load, uh, 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 LCP, last content paint, of um, under five seconds. So you've got to, and that's difficult to achieve on some websites. So you've got to make it fast. And really what you're looking for is sort of, you know, a one, two second load. Some websites are 30 second. It's ridiculous in this day and age. The next thing that we need to consider is the mobile friendliness of it. And by the way, if Google doesn't score highly on these things, if you were Google, would you rank that website high? High? The answer is no. So even if you think your website's mobile friendly or you think your website's fast, you need to check it in the tool. Google mobile friendly test. Put it. Put your website in there and you'll soon see some details and some tips on what you could do to improve uh, the uh uh, uh, the mobile friendliness. The next thing I do, I love I love um, search queries in Google. Uh, hopefully, some of you are familiar with site colon. So I take your website, and I would then put site colon in front of it. So I'd keep the HTTPS part, but I'd then put site colon. And what that does is it shows you all the pages that Google has indexed of your website. And Okay, it takes a bit of training and a trained eye, but what you would then do is you'd look through that entire list of pages to, to sort of see, are there any errors? Are there any pages that you wouldn't have expected to be there? Are there any things that just look a bit strange? Or, you know, do you look at it and think, well, yeah, this looks all good. And, and also it gives you a number at the top. So here it's got a thousand results. So a thousand pages just on my website. Is that right? Does that feel right? Is it too high? Is it too low? So this helps you get a bit of an idea on what's going on inside uh, uh, Google's index. If you've got questions, please do ask. The next thing is to make sure that you've got tracking in place. So whether you're an e-commerce site, whether you're a, a service site, there's lots of different tracking you can have. And the most obvious one is Google Analytics, because what we want to do is we want to feed data to Google. We want to show Google that, you know, we are a great shop. We are a great website. People are doing what we want them to do on our website. And we need to show Google that. So we need to set up event tracking. We need to set up uh, goal tracking in Google Analytics. We need to set up e-commerce tracking. All of those things are going to help us understand the data, but also demonstrate to Google that people are interacting on our site. And the more events you can set up, the better. Because, you know, okay, maybe they're not buying yet. Totally understand. But what we can do is we can demonstrate that people are watching videos, people are going to service pages, people are, are scrolling more than half the page, et cetera, et cetera. There's lots of different events that we can set up. And all of that data helps Google understand you and like you more. And the more data uh, Google has on a website, the more chance it's going to rank you higher. And this is about trying to tick as many boxes as possible. So as I said, if you've got questions, please do ask. Uh, and uh, But hopefully this is making sense so far. So I will move on to uh, my next slide, which is all about meta titles and meta tags. Now, most of you will be very familiar with this. But again, a lot of people don't always think about it enough. So we've got meta titles, we've got meta descriptions. These things are a hidden part of code on each page. And they're so important because it's what not just Google sees, it's also what the user sees as well. If they're written well, and if Google trusts you, Google uses them to show against your advert, your free organic advert, it uses the title and the description that you've put inside the code of your website. You need to make sure that they're relevant to the page, and you need to make sure that they're keyword rich. You need to think of the keywords that you're trying to be found for and make sure that you're using them in the meta titles and descriptions. And there's so many audits I do that as I get deeper into the site, there's a whole subsection of pages that haven't been considered in terms of titles and uh, descriptions. And so some of these things are, are, tend to be quite basic, but are often missed and overlooked. The next thing is the heading tags. So a page, every single page across your website should have a H1, just one of them the most important title, and that shows the relevancy about the page, and it helps Google understand the page. But then consider using H2s and H3s at least. 
So in blogs, you'd want a H1, you'd want some H2s, some H3s. On service pages, one H1, then some H2s, then some H3s. The same across all pages. The next thing that I would look at is something called canonical tags. Now, canonical tags are used to correct some of the issues that happen across your website. And I'll give you a couple of different examples. So the first example is perhaps you sell red t-shirts, you sell clothing, you sell red t-shirts, you sell them in small, medium, large, and extra large. And you have four different pages for those red t-shirts in different sizes. Now, the reality is that the content is all the same. There's no real difference. And what we're doing is we're producing lots of duplicate content. So what we do is we'd use a canonical tag to say, okay, these are the four different pages, the four different t-shirts, but actually this is the canonical tag. This is the, the main page. And we're going to use the canonical tag to say to Google, all of these pages actually are focused on this one page. Otherwise, you end up diluting the content and duplicating content. But another good reason for a canonical tag is to solve things like www websites versions versus non w versions or http versions versus https versions or a great use of canonical tags is understanding uh, uh, capitals and non-capitals because Google sees a difference between capital and non-capital letters. And what we need to make sure is that if you go to a deep page of your website and change one of the letters in the words of the URL to an uppercase, what happens? Do we, t do we send the user to a broken page? Do we send the user to the same page? But more importantly, what do we tell Google? And we need to use canonical tags on every single page to say to Google, however someone got here, this is the exact URL of this page. And so important, so important. Do we have any questions? Uh, could you advise what are step to set up SEO? Could you advise what are steps to set up SEO? Uh, so... Um, uh, I guess I'm advising that right now. Steps to set up SEO. That's, I mean, yeah, it's really difficult. It's like, you know, sort of asking me, how do I build a house? Um, <laughs> I, I'm trying to show you all the things to consider. Um, and uh, and as a guide, you might want to go to uh, moz.com. Um, and Moz is one of the biggest search engine platforms in the world. Uh, if you if you Google uh, the uh, 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 basic guide to SEO, Moz, I'm sure you'll find the beginner's guide, I think it's called. Uh, and that's a great guide to just get you started in SEO and help you sort of figure lots of things out. Uh, so hopefully, Beryl, that answers your question. Um, so we've got canonical tags. Let's move on to the next one, robots.txt. So how, when was the last time you checked your robots.txt? If you go to your website and put a, a, a forward slash and then robots.txt, R-O-B-O-T-S, dot text, and see what's in there. Are we telling Google that, it can look at our website. Are we telling Google pages not to look at? And there can often be mistakes inside a robot.txt file. So it's something that I would check and make sure that it's been set up correctly. The next thing that I would check is Search Console. Google Search Console is such a valuable tool. We can't give Google a call and ask about search engine optimization. We can ask about pay-per-click and Google AdWords, if we're spending money with Google, of course we can speak to Google. But if we're not spending money with Google, or if we want to talk about search engine optimization, there's no one to speak to. But Google Search Console is a communication tool. It tells us stuff about what Google, what's in Google's databases, and we can use it to, to tell. Uh, we can use it to tell Google about our website. So, for example, we can turn around to Google and say, actually, I don't want you to index this part, or I want you to index us at a faster rate or a slower rate. Um, Google can turn around and say, you know, we've got some security issues we've noticed on your website. We can see that your WordPress is not up to date, for example. And if, if Google's telling you that, then it's probably putting a mark against you. But Google can tell you about errors that you've got, about schema that it's seen that's not working or that is working, about pages that are, are erroring out or uh, sitemaps that have invalid uh, 
uh, URLs. There's so much data in there that my advice is to make sure you spend some time in there understanding it so that you can use it to communicate to Google and Google, you're listening to what Google is saying. So important. And the other thing to consider in here is looking at the uh, performance area of, of uh, Search Console because it shows you how uh, about your pages that are indexed. Google Analytics is brilliant. Google Analytics uh, tells you what's happening when someone's on your website. Search Console tells you all about everything prior to the website. So everything that's in Google, how many pages rank, what pages rank, where you what, what position you're typically in, what keywords tri trigger your uh, content, um, how many uh, different uh, products it can see on your website, how many different reviews it can see on your website, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, Mia's asked a question. We've got a separate service page with its own URL apart from our main website. I'm unsure of how that affects SEO, if it does at all. So uh, a separate service page with its own URL apart from our main website. So are you suggesting that the domain name is different? And if the domain name is different, then that could be a good thing or it could be a bad thing. If you're a huge company and you've got lots of different services that are very different from each other. So if we take Walmart and Walmart have, you know, Walmart flowers and Walmart shopping and Walmart clothes, then it's very clear that you'd have three, four, 20 different websites. But if you're a small organization that has very similar products and services, you'd expect it to just be on one domain name. I think Beryl was asking for a link to the uh, Moz Beginner's Guide of SEO, which I'll pull up and uh, share with you in a second. Uh, okay, so the next thing to consider is uh, your 404 page. So if you create a, um, oh, one second, my slides have stopped. Oh, okay, sorry. One second. Ah, okay. It's coming back. Uh, so if you go to your website and put a load of nonsense at the end of your uh, URL, what happens? Do you get to a friendly 404? Does it come up with just a white page? Make the user have really good user experience and usability. And maybe turn your 404 page into something fun and friendly. That would be my advice. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's a good link. I'm going to send you the exact link that I'm talking about. If you look at, if you really are at a basic level looking to get started in SEO, have a look at this link that I've just posted in the chat. Um, I don't recommend spending too much money with the Moz, by the way, uh, but they are great at sort of walking through the steps. The next thing to consider is the Google search links box. So I don't know if you've noticed, but under some brands in Google search, you'll see a, a, a search box, another search box. And in that search box, you can use it to search your site or the brand site. So how do you get that search box? Well, the answer is you need to, t if you've got a search on your website, you need to tell Google that you've got a search. And if you Google, um, Google site links search, Google site link search, you'll get to a Google page that tells you how to tie those two things up to say to Google, look, we've got a search on our website. This is how it works. Feel free to use it in your platform. And that gives yet just another way of users accessing, gives you more uh, collateral on Google's homepage. The other thing we need to consider is og tags. Og tags, O-G tags, are tags that are used by Facebook and LinkedIn and all the social platforms to understand meta titles, meta descriptions, and images. So when sh someone shares your content, are we making it easy for people to share? But also, are we making it easy for the search for the uh, social platforms to use the right image, to use the right words? and to give that really good experience. These are all things that Google looks at. So those are the og tags, and you could go to uh, Facebook uh, developer tools. Sorry, I'll just go back to that slide. Facebook developer tools. If you Google uh, og tag, uh, Facebook, uh, sorry, just simply Google og tag tester Facebook, you'll get to this page. You can put your URL in, you can put a blog in, and you can see what og tags are set on your website. Other things I'd look at is make sure you've got an SSL certificate, so that having that HTTPS, Google, again, has very clearly said that that's uh, a must. Having a look at your IP address of your server, so find the IP of your, your server, then 
uh, checker blacklist. So if you just simply Google uh, blacklist checker, there's lots of them about. So uh, MX Toolbox is a great one, MX Toolbox. You can put the IP address in there. It tells you if you're on any blacklist because if you were Google and you saw that a server was on blacklist, wouldn't you lower that page in your web, in your in your search engine? I would. So we need to make sure it's not in a blacklist, and we need to make sure that we check that on a regular basis. How how else could we speed up the website? Well, we could use a CDN, a content delivery network. Again, not going into too much detail right now, but the point is is that all your media files, all your pictures, videos, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, would be put inside a content delivery network which would mean that that would hugely speed up your website so that when someone visits your website, instead of your server having to serve those images, the, the CDN would serve those images. There's, there's a Cloudflare is okay. I don't like it, um, but uh, Cloudflare is certainly one that you could look at. Uh, we we love Rackspace, uh, and uh, I would never use any other, any other uh, hosting except for Rackspace, but there we go. So I want to talk about schema. I want to talk about rich snippets. And here is an example of job schema, job adverts inside Google. I don't know if you are a recruitment company at all, or if you ever advertise jobs on your website. But my advice is to uh, use a product called schema, schema.org. I'll put that in the chat. And if you, and using job schema, you can mark up content on your website that says to Google, this is the job title, this is the job description, this is the salary, this is the uh, working hours, uh, this is the job advert. And what Google does is it starts populating it into its job board. But you, but that's what this whole accessible piece is about, making it easy for the search engine to understand the content. So here we'd use schema and we'd mark up the content to say, this is job schema. Maybe you sell products. Well, there's product schema. So again, going to schema, you could use product schema. The other thing that you can do with products is you can upload them to Google Merchant Center. And I'll come on to that just a bit later on. The next thing is that you can uh, use FAQs, which I talked about earlier. So you can use FAQ schema to mark up all your questions and answers across the website. And that helps you get into the people also ask box. So that's again using schema and it's using FAQ schema. Other schemas include event schema. So if you've got some events on your website, you can mark them up and that helps you get into the event board on Google and you just need to use schema to mark them up to say, this is the event, this is the price, this is the time, this is the date, this is the location, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe you've got a website with recipes on. You could mark them up using recipe schema. There's so many different types of schemas. Let's talk about offsite. So we've talked loads about onsite, and it's the technical aspect. It's the accessibility. It's, you know, how easy it is to use. On the offsite side of things, we need to think of the reviews, the reputation, the trust. What are people saying about us? What links have we got? And the most obvious place is Google My Business. Google My Business is a free listing site that, that, that is Google, but it's, it's like the yellow pages, the white pages for Google. If you've got a brick and mortar business, you should absolutely have a listing, whatever you sell, whatever product or service you sell. And you should be filling out every single bit of detail. If Google's asking you a question, you should be putting something in that answer box. In every answer box, the more detail, the better. The more photos, the more uh, products and services in there. You can, If you are a product website, you can go to Google Merchant Center and you can set up a product feed that goes from your website to Merchant Center, and it tells Google all about the products on your website. So you could use Schema, but you could also add the list in the Google Merchant Center. Two very important things. But Google My Business is probably the real place to start if you haven't, to optimize it, to make sure you've got the right content in there, to think of keywords, and to make sure you're using it as much as possible. The next thing to do is to give lots of signals to Google that you are a real business. And one of the ways to do that is called local citation optimization. And that's about finding all the different local citations across the world that are relevant to your business. Maybe you're a lawyer, so there's some specific uh, law citation directories. Uh, depending on what you are, I would find lots of different directories that are relevant and trusted 
and put your name, your business name, your organization name, your address, your phone number, make sure it's in the same format as your Google listing. And what that does is it helps Google start understanding that you are a real business because you're in lots of different directories. Um, it's the same business phone number, the same email address, the same uh, uh, postal address, and it starts getting a much bigger picture of you. What we also need to concentrate on is reviews. So what reviews could you get? Could you get some reviews on um, Google My Business? That would be the first place to get. Obvious, hey, if I was Google and I was looking to rank a website and I wanted to look at the trust, well, I'd look at Google reviews first. So you need to have a Google review strategy. Or what about Trustpilot? What about TripAdvisor? What about reviews.io? There's lots and lots of review sites. And Google looks at all of these to get a good picture of how trustworthy you are. So when we talk about link building, we're talking about having your website at the center of this. And it looks a bit like a spider's web. Lots and lots of different layers and different types of links. Loads of different types of links. So it could be uh, links from PR. It could be links from uh, uh, from suppliers. It could be links from clients. could be links from social media. It could be links from uh, companies that you collaborate with. Uh, it could be guest posts, lots of different types. And what we need to think about is having a real cross-section of links to demonstrate to Google that there's lots of different stuff. And to give you a whole list of ideas, which I haven't got time to go into right now, but there's a whole list of ideas on how to create some links, how to come up with some link ideas. So again, if you want the slides, just to remind you, if you just email me, johnny at fleek.marketing, I think it's been pinned in the chat. Uh, I don't know if we can put that in again. And if you just put in the subject line, slides, I can then share the slides with you. Feel free to have these. Um, there's loads of ideas on the link building slide here. Uh, all sorts of ideas that I've seen work with many different clients. And it's just about trying to understand what might work in your uh, market. So I'll just throw that uh, email address in again. So, and then marketing. And then if you just put slides in the subject, I can then send those slides to you. So let's have a look at what more tools that we could use. Well, we could have a look at all of these tools. If we're looking to understand the backlinks on your website, then these are great tools. They're great tools that also uh, are also helping with understanding competitors and with ranks. Um, and um, what you might want to do is, is maybe a 30-day free trial on some of these tools just to maybe export some data to understand it. I'm not saying, I'm not suggesting you need to spend lots and lots of money. It's about just really understanding what data there is. Uh, Seren says, do we need to frequently update older blog content and product pages? Should we be using new keywords and content ideas each time? Also, do comments on product pages help in improving search rank? Well, the answer is yes to all of those questions. My advice is to frequently update content, to add new keywords, uh, and to get user-generated content. User-generated content really helps with uh, with keywords, but also demonstrates to Google that there's some interaction. And so I highly recommend doing that. Other tools to look at on site, we could look at Screaming Frog for links. We could look at Google Lighthouse and we could look at WooRank. Highly recommend you look at all of those tools. Just want to summarize something. So the big opportunity right now is that featured snippet at the top of Google's page. And that's about whether it be, it looks like this. It's the sort of position zero. It's that extra position. It's not position one, it's the top position. And it and it can be in the form, uh, it could look like this. It could be in the, uh, in the form of, uh, let me just fast forward. It could be in the form of paragraphs. It could be in the form of lists, or it could be in the form of tables. So how do, you, how do you get into that? It gives you the branding opportunity. It gives you clicks. It gives you images. And it's about the conversation. It's more conversational content. It's about instead of, uh, I'm just going to fast forward to another slide because um, the key thing is all the basics that I've talked about, but it's just using slightly different language. So all of the stuff I've talked about, the mobile first, the longer tail keywords, but using words like this, so who, what, were, how, best way to, how to, what is the best. And that is the sort of content that you need to include. And it's about making sure that you've got FAQs. It's about using schema. It's about, um, I've talked about the examples of schema. And it's about thinking local because 22% is local. 
And I just want to very quickly say that I've got a podcast. You're very welcome to join me. I'd, in fact, love you to join me uh, and be a listener on my podcast or maybe even be a guest. I'm going to pop that in the chat. You've been amazing. I've got to go. I will continue this conversation online afterwards at Johnny Ross. Thank you so much. Love you all. Take care. Bye-bye.